The Lord be with you. We welcome you to Zion today. We gather for worship to celebrate the Lord's gifts to us. I have a few announcements to share with you, things going on in the life of Zion, ways for you to be involved. So today is the end of our Sunday school year, and our plan, and we'll see if we're able to pull this off yet, the weather may not cooperate, uh, but was to have some fun activities and so forth outside for our Sunday school kids. But obviously, if it's raining and so forth, we'll have to retool that. But I want to say thank you to not only uh, our parents for faithfully bringing your children to church and to Sunday school. That's an important piece of our identity as Christians. But also to our teachers, administrators, Board of Education, uh, for the work that they've put in uh, week in and week out to make sure we're able to share Jesus with your children. That is a privilege that we have, and we celebrate that. And so we're, we're celebrating that today. We've come to the end of this Christian education year. But I really want to encourage you to make sure you're still in worship over the summer. I know summertime we do a lot of traveling. Totally understand that. But we want to prioritize that as a family. It's a huge piece of who we are. It's the center of who we are. So a way to think about this, one way I like to think about it, if you have a bicycle and you have the hub in the middle, and remember as Maybe some of you kids have the little spoke sliders on your, some of us who are probably older, that was more of a thing when we were young, right? If you know what I'm talking about. So the church is the hub and we're the spoke sliders, okay? And so we'll go out into our life during the week and then we come back and we go out and we come back. But in the center, we hold the church because there Christ comes to greet us in his word and brings his gifts to us. And so if we think of our life kind of in that way, uh, even though we might not have Sunday school, for, we'll have adult Bible class, and youth, you're welcome to come to that as well. But uh, we think about that throughout the course of the year, I think it's a healthy way for us to conceptualize our life as Christians. Now, a couple other items. After worship today, we have our second opportunity to support one of our four missionaries. Today we support Professor Oliver in Taiwan. We watched a brief video greeting from him last week. And if you didn't get a chance to do that, that would be online uh, in the service from last week. But what a neat opportunity you have to support Professor Oliver as he teaches at China Lutheran Seminary in Taiwan and equips people to share Christ both there in Taiwan and throughout Asia. It's a neat opportunity, so thank you in advance for your generosity. Also, you will see in your worship folder, VBS is coming like, like a month away, all right? So... Uh, you can register already. The, the, uh, the website is there to register. But we also need volunteers, and a lot of them, because if, if this year holds true to previous years, we'll have anywhere from 130 to 150 kids. That will take a lot of volunteers. So if you're able to participate in whether that's one day or if you're able to participate in some of the key leadership roles, helping to lead music, or helping with crafts and those sorts of things. Uh, if you ha have opportunity and you say, I think I could do that, visit with Shannon Walters or her mom Nancy or Kimber Opperman. Any one of them would be happy to share with you opportunities for you to be involved. And if you don't get a chance to talk to them in church, you can actually indicate you're willing to volunteer by the link here on online as well. So that, those are ways you can already start that. And there are paper forms also in the fellowship hall. Okay. Other announcements are there for you. I encourage you to take time to look over this so you can be involved in the life of Zion. Today's theme is Good Shepherd Sunday, so you will see that come through in our hymns especially and in our readings. So we turn to our opening song.
we stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Do you confess to Almighty God that you are a poor, miserable sinner? Yes. Do you confess to our merciful Father that you have sinned against him in thought, word, and deed? Yes. Do you confess that you justly deserve his temporal and eternal punishment? Yes. Do you believe that our Lord Jesus Christ died for you and shed his blood for you on the cross for the forgiveness of all your sins? Yes. Do you pray God for the sake of his, the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of his beloved Son to be gracious and merciful to you? Yes. Finally, do you believe that my forgiveness is God's forgiveness? Yes. Let it be done for you as you believe. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake, forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray together. Almighty God, merciful Father, since you have awakened from death the shepherd of your sheep, grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may hear the voice of our shepherd, we may know him who calls us each by name, and follow where he leads. 
through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Our first reading is from Acts chapter 20. We will have opportunity to visit more on this in our message in a few minutes. We begin with verse number 17. Now from Miletus, he, that's Paul, sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church to come to him. And when they came to him, he said to them, You yourselves know how I lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humility and with tears and with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of the repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I am going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all of you, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend to you, to, you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I cover, coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who are with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is from Revelation chapter 7, beginning with verse number 9. John writes, After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to stand as we sing together our Alleluia and verse. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 10th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. We begin with verse 22. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not part of my flock. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Kids, come on up and find a seat. Come on up. Welcome. Okay, for our time together, I actually have a volunteer already. He doesn't know it yet, but Isaiah, you're my volunteer today. Come here. You're going to be my helper. Come over here. You stand right here just for a second. In our gospel reading, Jesus talks about, he says that no one will snatch, no one will take his sheep out of his hand. And I want to illustrate that a little bit for you right now. Isaiah, if you can hold your hands up for me, I'm just going to pick you up with your hands, okay? Now watch what happens, okay? I can hold him here for a while, right? Every parent's done this, right? That's why, that's why I'm doing it with my kid and not yours right now, okay? Now, here's what I want you to do. Your turn. You pick me up. Okay, right. Ex right, because, because his hands aren't strong enough his body yet isn't big enough to do that. Someday if you're a dad, you'll, do with, you'll pick up your kids, all right? But I want you to understand, put your hands up there again. So I can pick him up and hold him because I have dad hands, okay? And I will hold him. And is, is anyone going to take him away from me? No, absolutely not. But are his hands big enough to hold me? No, okay. You can have a seat. I'm going to talk to you about that just for a second. Okay, it's really important. When Jesus says that no one will take them, him, the sheep out of his hands, he's saying he's strong enough to hold you. And that's really important because when we're little, we're not always that strong. We're not able to hold on strong. And adults, sometimes when we get older, that's also true, isn't it? And what Jesus is teaching us, he's not just talking about our hands like this. He's saying... The thing that keeps us with Jesus in his flock isn't just how strong we are and our ability to hang on to him, but how strong he is and his ability to hang on to you. And he has strong hands. And nobody is going to take you away from his hands. Not when you're little, not when you're old. And that's really important because sometimes when we're little, we can't always put all of our words in the right order to try to explain how we understand that Jesus is our Savior. Sometimes it's hard to get those words to line up. And sometimes when we're older, it's hard to get those words to line up. 
but our salvation doesn't depend on that. We have a Savior, he calls himself a good shepherd, and he says he will keep us. That's pretty, pretty neat to know, isn't it? Our salvation depends upon how strong he is, not how strong we are. And he will keep you, and that's his promise. We celebrate that in church. In fact, that's what our songs are all about today, the good shepherd Jesus who keeps us and holds us. But I wanted to help you understand when Jesus said that he will keep you, he has strong hands, and you can rest in those strong hands of your Savior and your shepherd Jesus. Thanks for being with listeners. You guys can head back to your seats, and we'll see you in our next song. Grace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. God speaks to us today in our reading from Acts chapter 20. Now you can see the title on the screen, What Pastors Are to Do, and that's where we're going to park for the majority of our conversation. But before we do that, we need to spend just a few minutes orienting ourselves to where we are in the book of Acts. So, Last week, we read about Paul's conversion, right? Acts chapter 9. Here in chapter 20, we fast-forwarded into Paul's third missionary journey. So Paul is now a seasoned missionary. Despite fierce opposition and some pretty intense hardships, he has planted churches throughout Asia, Macedonia, and Greece. So this would be modern-day Turkey and Greece. 
And now he's returning to many of these congregations to encourage them and to strengthen them in their confession of Jesus. A major chunk of his time was spent in Ephesus, which is western Turkey. In fact, Paul spent three years there establishing and strengthening the church. He builds meaningful relationships and sees significant fruit in conversions and in the growth of the church. But that growth brought opposition because Ephesus was home to one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, a major shrine to the fertility goddess Artemis. And that meant business for the silversmiths and craftsmen who earned a living selling replicas of the temple of Artemis. And that business was suffering because so many people were converting to Christ so that they weren't buying the shrines. And the short of it is this. The silversmiths and craftsmen stirred up a riot so that Paul ended up leaving town to spare his life. He headed further west into Macedonia and Greece, where he continued encouraging and strengthening the church. And then Paul and his companions, they celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread in Philippi, and they start heading toward Jerusalem. Now, Paul wants to get to Jerusalem by the Feast of Pentecost, so he basically has about 50 days. They have multiple stops to make along the way, and it's approximately a thousand mile journey by boat. So Paul, though, he wants to greet the elders, overseers, of the church in Ephesus. And we're going to come back to this, these terms, elder, overseer, in just a few minutes. But Paul wants to greet the elders, overseers, of the church in Ephesus on his way back to Jerusalem. But he's pushed for time, so Paul asks them to meet him at a nearby city of Miletus. Now, this is going to be a very emotional visit because Paul is fairly certain that he's never going to see them again in this life. Luke records Paul's words for us. He says this, And now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. But I do not account my life of any value, nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. It's actually pretty powerful stuff. And the visit's going to end with fervent prayer, with tears, with hugs, with this really emotional farewell. Our focus, though, is on Paul's instructions to these elders' overseers. Why? Because they provide insight into the question we are considering today, what pastors are to do. So let's get into it. So right off the bat, we need to take a look at these two words, elder and overseer, and we'll take each one of them in turn. So just like today, the word elder can have a variety of different meanings depending upon its context. So it can refer to an older individual. It can refer to a dignitary or magistrate of some kind. Like we saw last week in our Revelation reading from Revelation 5, it can refer to this human-like figure in the divine council in the spiritual realm. But here it clearly refers to a church office, to a position of authority or responsibility in the church. And that's important to point out because um, it's, we use that word elder today for one of the offices that we have in our local congregation. And I wish we had a better word for that because they, they don't mean the same thing. And that can really cause some confusion when you get into the biblical text. But it's what we've got, so we'll just need to educate ourselves on what we mean when the scriptures are using this term. So as we're going to see, the use of elder here in our text is a lot closer to what we mean by when we use the word pastor. Now, just a little bit of an aside here. The Greek for the word elder is still a word that's around today. I'll say it, and then I'll explain it. It's presbyteros. 
It's actually where the Presbyterian Church gets its name. They have a church governance structured around a system of elders or presbyters, all right? Now, that's neither really here nor there for our purposes, but I just wanted you to see that I didn't make this up, and I wanted to show you also that you actually knew a Greek word. You just didn't know it, all right? Now, if you read on in our text, and we're going to in just a minute, you'll see that Luke calls these same elders overseers. And the Greek word for overseer is episkopos or bishop. And you might hear the word episcopal in episkopos. And you'd see that the episcopal church gets its name from the episkopos, from this, this word, and they have this episcopal or bishop structure. All right? So now you know you know two Greek words. Our point for now, though, is that these elders are bishops. In other words, they're pastors. Okay, it's the word we would use today. Okay, it's taken me a long time to explain our title, what pastors are to do, but we've done it, so we're ready to get into the meat of our discussion. So let's listen to Paul's instructions for pastors. And this is really important today because the pastoral office, and if I could just speak bluntly, it's been watered down pretty badly today so that people think that pastors are supposed to be some sort of charismatic public speaker or the sort of vision casting leader or the brand for their church or someone who's supposed to be getting direct revelations from God or sort of the CEO for the church. And all of these ideas bring certain expectations with them. Many of them are not only not helpful, but they're not biblical. And we don't have time to get into these today because we need to spend our time in the Word, in the expectations that God's Word lays out for pastors. Now, we are going to have time to go to Paul's words in the pastoral epistles, so First and Second Timothy and Titus, where Paul goes into more detail in regards to the office of pastor. We're only going to have time to park here in Acts chapter 20 and get a flavor for what pastors are to do. So let's listen to Paul. He says, Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. See that word overseers? It's episcopos, bishop. To care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock, and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore... Be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are being sanctified. Okay, so let's make a quick observation and then get to the expectations. I want you to see the language that Paul uses for the church. He calls the church... The flock. This is why pastors are often referred to as shepherds. In fact, some translations actually use the word shepherd here in place of the word for care. So pastors are called to care for, to shepherd the flock, the people of God. Now this is more than we have time for, but just, just know that this sort of shepherd language, it has really deep roots in the Old Testament. It is not something that Paul just made up on the spot. Further, I want you to pay attention to this phrase here, in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, bishops, pastors. Paul sees the pastoral office as something God's Spirit is intimately concerned about. Pastors aren't just hired they are called by God's Spirit through His church. Now, I know I'm being very brief here, so if you have questions about this, I am really happy to visit about it. You can call me, email me, text me, come and talk with me. But I want you to see for now how Scripture regards the office of pastor. It's something that God's Spirit cares about. He wants His church to have pastors. 
And these pastors have distinct responsibilities. And if I can just add a brief note here, we need pastors. In fact, we have a growing shortage of pastors. I'm just putting that bug in your ear. You can do what you want with it, but please know we need pastors. Okay, so look at what Paul says to these pastors. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. A little later, Paul adds, be alert. Now, if we read on, we can see what Paul is talking about. He's concerned about false teachers infiltrating the church with literally crooked things, crooked teachings, crooked doctrines. So he's exhorting pastors, as he does in his pastoral epistles, to pay careful attention to the teaching to the doctrine of the church because teaching, because doctrine matters. In fact, in 1 Timothy, Paul writes to young pastor Timothy, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching, the doctrine. Persist in this, look at this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. See, teaching, doctrine matters. It's, it's like directions, all right? Directions matter. If you have a destination that you hope to reach, then de- directions matter. You never say, oh, any old directions will do. And you never say, ah, oh, I'm not too concerned about directions. Let's just make sure we've got some good music for the drive. You never say, directions are boring. We need something exciting to keep us interested on the way. Because here's the thing, some directions are wrong. And if you like being lost, then yeah, any old directions will do. If you like being lost, then yeah, focus on the music for the excitement. But if you want to arrive at your destination, then you're going to need good directions. Doctrine is no different. You need good doctrine. Any old doctrine won't do. And all the things that surround the doctrine, they're not the main thing. Great music with bad doctrine is like great music with bad directions. They're both going to leave you lost. So pastors need to know the doctrine of God. Pastors need to know the teaching of God. And that means they need to be listening to God, listening to where God speaks in his word. Paul talks about the Word of God, and we're going to get to that in just a minute. For now, we simply need to see that pastors need to know the Word. Now, if that word doctrine turns you off, then I'm just sorry about that, because somebody has killed it for you. I would encourage you to read May's newsletter. Read the article, The Greatest True Story Ever Told. It's an excerpt from 20th century Christian author and apologist Dorothy Sayers' essay, The Greatest Drama Ever Staged. There she recounts the doctrine of God, and there she says, If this is dull, then in heaven's name, what is worthy to be called exciting? So we've been journeying through our new member class for the past several weeks on Sunday afternoons. And do you know what we've been talking about? The doctrine of God. And this is, this is the most exciting stuff imaginable because we're talking about who God is, who we are, who Jesus is, how Jesus has reconciled us to the Father, how he brings the gospel to us in his church, what the word and the sacraments are, and, and so much more. This is why Paul says, pay attention to yourselves and to all the flock, preserve the doctrine of Scripture so that, well, let me just show you what Paul says. He writes, and now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. 
Right? Here's what he says. I commend you to God and to his word, to the message of grace in Jesus Christ, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are being sanctified, the inheritance of heaven, of the new earth, of an eternal reign with God, to give you an inheritance among the holy ones of God. This is what the word of God, the message of God, the doctrine of God has the power to do in Christ's church. It's about our eternal inheritance with Jesus and all his holy ones. Our inheritance with the redeemed on earth and the whole host of heaven. This is what the doctrine of God communicates. That's why pastors are supposed to pay attention. Why they're supposed to be alert. Why they're supposed to shepherd the flock of God. The church of God. Why the church of God needs to be hungry for good doctrine, for good teaching, because it's about your inheritance. And if that doesn't matter to you, then in heaven's name, what does? Friends, I simply want to leave you with this. You are the church of God. The flock of God, who God has obtained, claimed, owned through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And because he loves you, he has sent his spirit to call pastors and to bring his saving word into your ears and into your hearts. And that is what pastors do. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord to life everlasting. Amen. We stand. And with joy and boldness we confess together, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated as we gather our offering. Kids, you can bring your offering forward.
Before we stand to pray, happy Mother's Day to all mothers and ladies of the congregation. This is a day not only to celebrate our mothers who are living, but to remember those who have gone to be with the Lord, and we anticipate our reunion with them. And Scripture is very emphatic that those who die in Christ, we have the promise of a reunion. So we wish all ladies happy Mother's Day. I hope you have the opportunity, if your mother is living, to at least have a phone conversation with her. If not, that you're able to remember her and that we look forward to the day of reunion. We also recognize that there is brokenness in a relationship sometimes. And so we bring that grief to the Lord and we find comfort where we have places of grief. So we commend all of these things to the Lord. Let us stand to pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for our good shepherd, Jesus Christ, for his strong hands who hold us and keep us. We give you thanks that Jesus, by the working of his spirit, has raised up pastors and placed them in his church to bring your teaching, your doctrine into our ears, that we may hear it and hear that message of grace in Jesus and by hearing and the working of the Spirit to create faith, we might be saved. Strengthen churches and pastors that they may be wholly committed to the truth of God, to the purity of teaching, and to the word of grace in Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks, Lord, for the gift of mothers through which you funnel your love into our lives. Help each of us as we remember our mom, whether we visit with our living mother or remember our mother who has gone before us, or even if we have grief over a relationship that is broken. For those who have grief, may they find comfort and healing in Christ. May others who have joy find appropriate joy in the relationship with their mother or their memory of that relationship and the anticipation of reunion that we have in Christ. We commend mothers to your care, asking your blessing to be upon them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those in need of your care, Janice Munson, Pastor Johnson, Jay Kuhn, Paxton Burrell, Stan Bach, Joeen Bowman, Justine Schwizo, Nancy Grimm, Julie Weller, Jeannie Groon, Sherry Steffes, Jim Devers, Rick Spock, Patty Meaves, Jean Mankey, Lyle Munt, Tanya Jacobson, and Lois Gray. We commend them to your care, asking for grace sufficient for each day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our pastors and missionaries, especially today for Pastor Oliver as he serves in Taiwan, thank you for the privilege we have of supporting him. Also for cross-cultural worker Molly, give each of these individuals joy and boldness in service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For law enforcement and military men and women, Scott Stribe, Stephen Grimm, Marshall Hansen, Aaron Stokel, and Lillian Genzen, that they may be protected from harm and serve with integrity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our partnership with Trinity of Manila and for our preschool, that the gospel of Christ may be proclaimed and the love of Jesus known and the kingdom of God go forward. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the people of Ukraine and the church in Ukraine, that you may raise up people to bring mercy where mercy is needed, that you may open doors for the gospel, and that you might work through your means, Lord, to bring peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for our VBS, that you would bring children to hear the love of Christ and raise up volunteers so that we may bring that love of Christ in word and in deed. These prayers we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We joyfully continue with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and helpful that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. 
because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing together. We pray together, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
We stand to receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We turn to our final song.